And this is supposed to be the International Decade of Disabled Persons. Pretty amazing. If you see any examples of this type of stupidity, write to us. Even better, send us a photograph. I'm Joe Coughlin. And I'm Susan Pettit. You're watching DNet Disability Network. Now here's a roundup of disability stories from across the country. The first NDP government in Ontario's history was sworn in this week. Premier Bob Ray unveiled his cabinet and eliminated two junior ministries, those responsible for disabled people and seniors. Now both are under the wing of the Ministry of Citizenship. Joe Coughlin asked Ray to explain how this change would benefit the disabled. Joe, I, I, I looked at this very long and hard. I'll, I'll give you my sincere opinion. I don't think that those two offices of seniors and disabled people really gave, really gave the clout to those issues and to those ministries that they deserved. I think they were there. Uh, I don't think that, that, they really, that, that they really had input directly into the work of government and into the life of government. Um, my view, and it was again, it's based on my experience, is that the best way to, 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 to give those issues prominence and to give them advocacy is to give uh, a much tougher advocacy role to the Minister of Citizenship. We spoke with Tony Ruprecht, who was Ontario's first minister responsible for disabled persons under the Conservatives. Ruprecht said that the rolling the office for disabled persons into the Ministry of Citizenship will set back integration and independence for disabled people in Ontario. He called it a sad day for Ontario. Vancouver will play host to an international congress and exhibition on disability in April 1992. Rick Hansen, who is serving as chairman of Independence 92, says that over 7,000 people from around the world will attend the conference. The exposition will involve over 300 exhibitors of services and aids which promote an independent lifestyle for people with disabilities. But I think we're, we're now at the stage in society where uh, we stop talking about things and we start to get down to action. And one of the ways that we try to create a format for action is to provide a world forum where we bring leaders in uh, who uh, are experienced in the areas of disability, exchange ideas and information, and try to have specific outcomes that will continue to improve the lives of people with disabilities. In the last decade, the independent living movement has grown all across Canada. Independent living stresses self-help and self-reliance. Last week in Calgary, a conference was held to shape a vision for the next decade. Organized by the Canadian Association for Independent Living Centres, CALIC, the conference featured special parliamentary hearings on independent living. DNET was in Calgary to talk with conference participants. And I think we recognize an increasing need, and there's a, a recognition, I think, across the country and in, and in government that the concept of independence for and integration into society becomes increasingly important. And uh, I think that emphasis is being seen more now than it was perhaps back uh, 10 years ago. Fundamental to independent living is the empowerment of disabled individuals to control their own lives through the principles of individual choice and self-help. I'd say that, that uh, people with disabilities are one of the major groups that keep giving uh, visual form to this notion of, of what happens when you start believing in yourself. And that's really what empowerment's about, is, is people believing in their own capacity and then acting on it. Nearly three years ago, Joe Fillion suffered near-fatal burns when he was trapped in a fire at his home in Aurelia, Ontario. As he recovered in a special burn unit at a Boston hospital, North Americans read all about Fillion and the money poured in. Today that trust fund contains $100,000. The Fillion family live in a house that was built and furnished by Aurelia residents. But Fillion wants out, out of the harsh glare of a life under the public spotlight. I've got no, per no life. I, nothing I can do. I can't do anything without it going through all the press and everything. Joey's mother, Linda Hawkins, wants to move the family to this property near Campbell River, British Columbia, and live off the land. And that has some of the residents of Aurelia a little upset. But that's just it. He'll always be taken care of here, and he'll always be Aurelia's burn victim. And he won't be anything more than that. The house built for Joe with volunteer labor was organized by Ken McCann. Now McCann is locked in a bitter struggle with Linda Hawkins to prevent her from taking the trust fund out of Aurelia. But Joey Fillion says whether he gets the trust fund or not, he's moving to British Columbia. 
Just a couple of things to add to the Joe Fillion story. On a future program, DNET will be looking at the obligations that charity imposes on people with disabilities. We'd also like a reaction from our viewers. What do you think? And for the viewers in the Toronto and London areas, tune in to Monitor Monday night at 6.30 for more on the Joe Fillion story here on CBC. And by the way, Sue, for the benefit of viewers who wondered why Premier Bob Ray was looking up at me at the press conference, it was because the conference was down two flights of stairs. In other words, the place was inaccessible. The election in Ontario of deaf candidate Gary Malkowski is yet another indication of the growing power of disabled Canadians. But they have a long way to go to match the political clout wielded by Americans with disabilities. That political clout culminated one very hot day last summer in Washington on the very steps of the White House. Thousands of people with disabilities were on hand to watch President George Bush sign the historic Americans with Disabilities Act. This act is powerful in its simplicity. It will ensure that people with disabilities are given the basic guarantees for which they have worked so long and so hard. Independence, freedom of choice, control of their lives. It is indeed a law that protects people with disabilities from many forms of discrimination, including discrimination on the job and on public transportation systems. The White House signing culminated 10 years of struggle by people in the independence living movement. David Baker is executive director of the Toronto-based Advocacy Resource Centre for the Handicapped, ARCH. He says top U.S. politicians, unlike their counterparts here in Canada, have discovered the disabled vote. What happened was uh, Governor Dukakis was ahead of uh, Vice President Bush by 33 points, that is 33 uh, percentage points ahead of Bush three months before the actual election. At that point, on the advice from his disability committee, and both presidential candidates had leaders from within the disabled community advising them, uh, President Bush announced that he would, if elected, put in place the Americans with Disabilities Act. By the time the votes were taken, Bush was ahead of Dukakis amongst the 15 to 20 percent of the population identified as being disabled. And that is calculated as being 50 percent of President Bush's margin of victory. In other words, it was the largest single factor that led to Bush's election over Dukakis. Michael Winter is executive director of the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, California and is a leading disabled rights activist. We spoke to him at the recent Independent Living Conference in Calgary. I think the, the reason the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed was that the disabled uh, community was very well organized and that during the presidential campaigns, uh, they were very well organized in terms of trying to get uh, uh, Governor Dukakis and then Vice President Bush to sign on and say they endorsed the act. And we knew that was a critical time. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, or fortunately, uh, I'm not a uh, big supporter of uh, President Bush, but he had enough common sense to endorse the act. And he was 17 points behind in the polls when he did that. And he also uh, mentioned disabled people in his speech at the Republican Convention. And there are some uh, theorists and uh, individuals involved in politics that think that that was, uh, that helped him win the election, that it turned around three or four million votes. Rick Hansen, Canada's most highly visible disabled person, is equally impressed with the progress made by disabled persons in the U.S. It was one of the few times where people came together despite the different interest groups and the different kinds of disabilities that they represented, and they identified the fact that together there's a very powerful force. When you deal with about 13% of the population, plus an aging population which uh, by the year 2012 will be more than 50%, will be 60 years of age and older. Uh, so it's a very, very powerful force when you also expand that uh, to friends and family in the community at large with which they interact in. And uh, here in Canada, we are now just on the threshold of being able to bring uh, groups that represent people with disabilities, mostly consumer-driven, and say, look, uh, let's sit down and, and identify commonalities. And that's what Independence 92 is all about. I can't wait 
to see Gary's presence on the floor of the legislature and to see suddenly the bureaucracy of government realizing that for generations there have been deaf people who have not been able to communicate with government. I think the Ontario election is really the first election where I would say disability issues had moved into the mainstream. But as, to, as for how disabled people are and have been voting, we still don't know that. And I think uh, smart parties will direct their pollsters to find out in future. As you saw, Bob Ray used a sign interpreter the night of his election. He did not use one at his first press conference as premier, but there was an interpreter at the swearing-in ceremony. There are do's and don'ts when it comes to describing people with disabilities. One of the don'ts is the phrase, deaf and dumb. Which brings us to New York City and the recent visit there of Prime Minister Mulroney. The Prime Minister was asked if he thought Iraq's President Saddam Hussein was getting the message about withdrawing from Kuwait. Well, unless he's deaf and dumb, and I don't think he is, it's a very powerful message for him there. And if he's... We asked our do's and don'ts expert, Sandra Carpenter, What's wrong with the phrase deaf and dumb? Well, it, because number one, it's people aren't deaf and dumb. Dumb usually implies that you're not as smart as the next person. That's really not appropriate for the people that we're talking about here. And mute is also inappropriate because mute is, would imply that a person didn't really have any way of conveying their thoughts and ideas to someone else. And for people who are deaf and use sign language, I mean, they communicate through sign language, so it's probably more appropriate to refer to someone as deaf, and if they use sign language, they're a person who is deaf and uses sign language. Um, I don't think you should say deaf and dumb or deaf mute anymore. We'll be sending Prime Minister Mulroney a copy of Word Choices, a lexicon of preferred terms for disability issues. It was prepared by the now defunct Ontario Office for Disabled Persons. We'd also like to hear from you if you've noticed any other blunders in the use of language. We'll give you our address at the end of the show. Last week, we promised to expand on the news about the most recent discovery in gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. We have that story for you now. We at DNET have a personal interest in this breakthrough. Susan has cystic fibrosis, CF. She's prepared this feature story. Cystic fibrosis is an invisible disability which affects 33,000 people in Canada and the U.S. It is the most common genetic defect among Caucasians, affecting one in 2,000 babies and killing more Canadian children than any other inherited disorder. Most people are shocked by these statistics. More importantly, many people are surprised to learn that someone has cystic fibrosis. That's because CF has been referred to as the masquerader. It can just seem like a bad cold. Cystic fibrosis is much more than that. Overproduction of mucus builds up and clogs the lungs, trapping bacteria. Recurring fatal infections progressively damage the lungs, making it impossible to breathe. Mucus in the pancreas interferes with digestion, resulting in weight loss, and some cystics also develop diabetes. Because it's an internal kind of disease, it's, it's not that obvious, and it can be very hard for them to people for people to realize how ill they are, because it doesn't show. Craig McCrady is 16. He has been admitted to the hospital for sick children for antibiotic therapy and a lung transplant assessment. Hospitalization is nothing new to him. I, I get sick quite easy. So, like I've been in maybe about five times this year. It amazes me sometimes how, how all of them can keep going and, and how they can just keep plugging away and, and doing their treatments and because it's not easy. Daily therapy and a strict regime are necessary for those with CF. Frequent medical assessment and pulmonary function testing are a big part of this. It kind of gets on my nerves, like I'd rather be out doing other stuff, but I figure if I don't do it, then I just get sick and come here. I've kind of gotten used to it because I've done it since I was little. When I wake up in the morning, I do a mask, inhalation mask and physio. And then uh, when I have breakfast, I take I think it's nine pills with my breakfast, and then I go to school. And then uh, with lunch in the cafeteria, I take my pills as well. And then um, after school, 
I take another physio and mask, inhalation mask. And with supper, I take pills, and then also have another mask and physio before I go to bed. A lot of my friends, um, like the friends that are close to me, they know I have it and understand it. Why do people think they're going to catch a cold? When they first, you? when they first hear that I've that I've got the sickness, they, you know, the first thought is, oh, can I catch it? And you just tell them no, and it's genetic. There's no way you can catch it. In total, there are about 10,000 different genes. Each one is responsible for making a different protein, which in turn is used to build a particular structure or carry out a certain job in the body. Inherited disorders like CF arise when certain genes fail to produce a critical protein. Now under laboratory conditions, scientists have succeeded in correcting the defect that causes CF. The announcement represents a major milestone. What promise does this discovery hold for people with cystic fibrosis. Just a year ago finding the location of the gene was really exciting for us because we really thought that was the first step to trying to find a control or a cure for it. And now that we have found uh, exactly what we can do about switching, transplanting that gene, it, it, I think it is a first tangible hope that there really can be a cure for cystic fibrosis. How do you propose that they will administer this gene, is that a big problem? Administering the gene will be a big problem because you have a lot of things to worry about. First of all, how to get it into cells efficiently so that it works. Also, you have to worry about if you make too much of the gene product, is that a problem? Like, it could be toxic. Uh, but nevertheless, all these things are being looked at and studied very extensively to try to get this to work. But this first experiment was very important because it certainly said that it could work. We try and, and be as honest as we can and say it looks good. However, we have to. This is a laboratory. We have to wait and see how we can really apply it to, to people. And you know, we're we're certainly, you know, this is this is a breakthrough for us. But we have to go through it phase by phase and just see how we can actually work with it and and how we can apply it to patients and families. So, what does this mean for the future of cystic fibrosis patients? I think that brings a lot of hope, and it certainly was very very exciting. Is it going to change their lives? I hope so. I can like eventually just hopefully forget the CF bit, like all physio and mask, but for the younger kids it's it's a lot better. Well I'm glad it was made because it's actually something that'll help me, you know what I mean? Like um a lot of discoveries like like things a lot of the discoveries are really good, but you know, I figure it'll help the babies that are born and stuff like that, and that's great. It's going to be a like a big difference, so that I can live a pretty regular lifestyle. And this will actually help me and ex extend my life. If you were disabled and you need an attendant to help you, how do you let them into your home or apartment before you get up in the morning? Well, I guess you could give them a key, or you could opt for a more high-tech solution. Bruce Druitt, one of our experts on technology, is back again this week to show us how it can be done. Come in. Nice to see you. Hi, Susan. How would you do that? I use this remote control. Normally the door is locked, but this remote control helps me to open it. It's really important for people who use wheelchairs, and also the door stays open for a while. More importantly, though, for people who use attendants, it's really helpful when they're alone to open the door. Beyond this remote control, the door looks pretty normal. Are there any other special features? Well, Susan, there are a number of features associated with this door, which makes universal design beneficial for everyone. First of all, we have a low threshold with the door, which creates level access. We also have an aluminum plate, which allows, for example, a person who uses a wheelchair to be able to move close to the door without worrying about scratching the door. We also have a door handle here, which has a much larger surface area than most, and makes it easier for a person to grab easier than, for example, a door handle that's round. You've got two peepholes. How come? Well, what this does is it creates, again, uh, good use through universal design. Uh, because people use wheelchairs or other assistive devices, they may be sitting at different levels. By having them located at different heights, that allows the person to be able to see out the door. It's also useful for people such as children who may be of differing heights. Since you mentioned the outside of the door, are there any special features that we should know about? 
Yeah, I think there are a couple of features that are of note. First of all, we have an illuminated doorbell, which makes it easier for people to see who are visually impaired. We also have a deadlock bolt outside, which means that the door is generally locked. However, from the inside, the door is always easily opened. It's never locked, and that makes it easier for people to open in case of a fire or any other safety consideration. Amazing number of things to think about, even with something as simple as a door. And they all help to improve access. If you'd like to know more about any of these features, drop us a line and we'll pass on your request. And now, here's some of the letters we've received from viewers across the country. This first one is from a Mrs. Muriel Burley from Whitby, Ontario. She wanted to know if our show was closed captioned, and yes it is. She also wondered when it regularly aired. Mostly it will appear at 12.30 on Saturdays in Toronto, but you should check your local listings for time and date. This letter is from Charles Dunstan of Weston, Ontario. Having watched your program on two occasions, I must say that it is refreshing. It is a refreshing turn of events when media coverage, print or electronic, of the problems of those who are disabled does not reach for money or for sympathy. You appear to strive for a true understanding of the thoughtlessly imposed barriers which we face as we pursue our way in life's mainstream. The usual extremes of temperament exposed in the media range from sympathy coaxing to militancy by disabled people. In my opinion, the first is despicable, the second is most rude. I am always upset and ashamed by such exposures. Do keep up your good work. It is most heartening, for I am sure that the example set by your work can be a living matrix for those who would follow your lead. Thank you, Charles. This last letter is from Sandra Solomon. She's from Hall, Quebec and she also has cystic fibrosis. She's written in about the parking permits. I don't abuse this privilege, and I stress that it is a privilege, which I am thankful for. I don't use the parking permit unless I really need to. Personally, I'm glad I've decided to swallow my pride. Being labeled as handicapped when struggling to maintain a normal life isn't easy, but the parking permit has truly helped me on a few occasions. I'd be silly not to overcome the obstacle called pride, because after all, my well-being is important to me. That's all the time we've got for letters this week. Now remember, if you've run across any bizarre examples of architecture, like our ramp that leads to a flight of stairs, let us know about it. And we'd like to hear your views on the obligations that charity imposes on those who've received it. You can drop us a line at the Disability Network, CBC, Fox 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Earlier this week in Toronto, the media was invited to inspect Via Rail's refurbished transcontinental passenger train, the New Canadian. Via claims it is accessible. I don't agree. A wheelchair user has to be lifted in, and he or she has to use a special narrow Via wheelchair, which has to be pushed. They can't use the washroom if they don't have an assistant. Hey, so on a scale of 1 to 10, Joe, how does it rate? Well, if accessibility is supposed to mean independence, my independence, I give them a big fat zero because you have to depend on so many staff to get around this train. It's, it's pretty wild. And that's our show. We'll see you again next week. I'm Susan Pettit. And I'm Joe Coughlin.